And we're recording. Thank you. Welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home are located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen, the Songhees, and the Squamish First Nations in Victoria, British Columbia. I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to learn and to live on this territory. I encourage you all to consider the traditional territory on whose land you are on today, wherever you are. So this week is uh, part of Heritage Week in British Columbia, and the theme for Heritage Week is where do you find heritage? You might be thinking of monuments and plaques or landscapes and events. One event 56 years ago on February 18th, 1965, was an avalanche near Stewart in northwestern BC that killed 26 workers at the Grand Duke copper mine. The legacy of that event has been preserved in the Stewart Museum, in a town memorial, and in a documentary film. To learn more about what happened and the aftermath, I have two guests. Shirley Rosicek lives in Stewart and works at the Stewart Museum. She was a guest on RBCM at Home back in August, and you can see a recording of our visit to the Stewart Museum on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. Ron Getz is a filmmaker with Partners in Motions and has produced a documentary on the slide as part of a series called Disasters of the Century. You can stream the documentary from Amazon Prime or as of February the 18th on his YouTube channel, Bad Day HQ, which hosts primary, primarily historical material. Before becoming a filmmaker, Ron lived in the Stewart area as a teenager and as a young adult. And in addition to hiking around the old mine sites, he worked at the Grand Duke Warehouse for three years. Hello, both of you, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Shirley, let's start from hearing, uh, let's start by hearing from you. Okay, so um, I guess uh, you can't really talk, I, the story of Grand Duke was incredible. Um, in the early 1960, Grand Duke brought prosperity to the historic mining town of Stewart, BC. Stewart is located at the head of the Portland Canal. And we're about two miles from Hyder, Alaska on the southern tip of the Alaskan Panhandle. So um, our neighbors in Hyder, hello today too. Stuart uh, was to have another boom and a very, after a very long downturn in its history, the Grand Duke Operating Company constructed a residential suburb in the town site, uh, modern homes and apartments um, um, for about 750 working men with families that uh, they stayed in the town, new schools and hospitals were built and, and for the growing population and a new community center was uh, put up to uh, provide a focus for many of Stuart's activities, their social activities. Stuart, of course, was very remote and had no road access until 1974. So transportation into the town site was first of all, a uh, lower right-hand screen via trans-provincial airlines uh, from Prince Rupert to the Stewart Airport in a 12-seater Grumman Goose. An alternate form of transportation was available by water and uh, Grand Duke themselves owned a vessel called the Lumba Lumba. It could accommodate 30 passengers in aircraft style seating and believe me, I'm sure they had some many, many rough trips coming up in the winter time to Stewart. For many of the workers that came to Stewart uh, once they got here, um, would they stay and work? Well, maybe not. Some just got off, looked around and went, this isn't for me and I'm out of here. Remoteness in mining is a real challenge to get people to come here to work. If you stayed, you ended up with a long 32 mile journey up to the mine on a, on a crazy road. So Grand Duke is located at the headwaters of the, of the Leduc River, 25 miles north of Stewart. Nothing about the development of Grand Duke was easy. The deep ore body was partially covered by glacier so open pit mining was uh, not really feasible. The terrain was too rugged for overland access to Tidewater and Stewart and weather too treacherous to permit building a, con a concentrator at the location of the main ore body. 
The most feasible and nearest site for the concentrator was 11 miles away. The solution for this was to drive a tunnel uh, under intervening mountain ranges and glaciers from the mine to the concentrator. Um, the endeavor was to be challenged by some of the most severe obstacles in nature ever placed in the path of a mineral discovery or mine development. September 1964 tunneling began. Um, once again, the tunnel was uh, 11 miles in length passed under three glaciers and three mountain ranges uh, over 7,000 feet high. Because the tunnel was the lifeline of Grand Duke, it had to be designed for fast, large scale, safe transport for people uh, or and the supplies that were moving back and forth through the tunnels. 15 feet in di diameter, uh, it needed to carry a high speed railway system in the tunnel. Um, and was driven by crews in camps from both ends, one on the Leduc camp where the main ore body was, the other at Tide Lake where the concentrator was to be built. By February 1965, the men at Leduc camp had, had uh, driven 28 feet. And on February 18th, 1965, with 154 men in camp, disaster struck. An avalanche roared down, demolishing most of the camp. 68 men were caught in the avalanche, 26 of those uh, killed and 20 injured. And from there, um, we'll go back to Ron for a little bit more information on the uh, slide itself and some other information on the line. Great. Well, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be with you today. I looked at some of the participants, recognized some uh, familiar names from when I lived in Stewart. And uh, so I've made it sort of almost a kind of major part of my life to do a lot of historical documentaries. And almost all our programming, as Kim mentioned, is historical. Um, I love the time I spent in Stewart. It's a hard place to describe because of its history and its natural beauty and its ruggedness. So I always found, uh, I think once you've been to Stewart, it's something that stays in your blood. It's just one of those really special places that's hard to forget. Um, so I just wanted to go, there is a picture I wanna share. And I'll, I'm gonna try to do this. First of all, I guess I better share. We're gonna try this. Um, I hope you can see that okay. Not yet, Ron. So if you, you select oh. uh, your share screen and then try opening it again. Lee Murphy has a question for Ron. Go ahead and type your question in there, Lee. Oh, there, there we go, probably. Let me just get this up first. <laughs> you bet. How's that? Oh, that's quite beautiful. So I'm Okay, so this that. is a picture off an old brochure. Some of you might recognize it, but it does give a really good description of the head of the Portland Canal. And so this gives you some idea of what the challenge was with the Grand Duke Mine. So as Shirley pointed out, here's, if you can see my cursor, this is Stuart. Um, the, loading whoops, the loading facility is down here. Uh, Bear Glacier is around the corner up here, and this is the Bear River. And on this side, of course, this is this line along here, of course, is the Canada-US border. So this is the Canadian side, the US side is on this side, and this is the Salmon River. And back here is the Salmon Glacier. Um, and so the Duke is actually way back in here. Uh, you'd have to go up the glacier and over. And um, so you, to get it from there to the concentrator, you could see that it would be almost an impossible task. And so Tide Lake is, was here. So the idea is that the mountain, the tunnel would be driven through all these glaciers and mountains to Tide Lake, then would be taken by truck all the way down to the concentrator. And if you look carefully, you can see a very thin line here. It's very faint. That's the uh, Tide Lake mine road uh, close to the glacier, just as you come around to see the glacier. So that gives you an idea of just really the, the challenge that, that there was there. And so the idea when they were driving the, the, the tunnel is that while they were building the concentrator, they would be, for the 
trying to get the tunnel done quickly, they would, as most tunnels are, in, in a lot of cases, they're driven from both ends and they meet in the middle. So that was the idea behind the, uh, the idea of trying to get this tunnel done quickly. Uh, there's one other, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. I'm just seeing if, oh, this might be quite interesting, so. Um, I don't share my screen too often, so that's a bit of a challenge for me. So if you can see this, um, this is the Salmon Glacier as it goes up to the Leduc. This picture was taken in July. So you can still see there's quite a bit of snow on, on the glacier. And so what they would do is they would, before the tunnel was, and the tunnel from Leduc would have been on this side, they would use cats to go up into and over into, into the, the Leduc area. So the, the glacier is fairly flat in here. And so the snow, even in July, there's quite a bit of snow. And um, let me just, I'm trying to minimize this so I can get the pic, oh, there we go. Okay, so now this is a horrible picture, but I, it's important to understand this. So this is actually a glacier around February, March, about the time. It's a, it's a picture I took, but it's very badly been damaged. And so you can see a lot of speckles, but you can see how the crevices have been really covered in the snow. And so the cats would go along these types of, well, maybe not quite as steep as this, but in some cases, fairly close to the steepness to get up to, to Leduc. And a lot of snow accumulated on, on the mountain. Uh, and so that was the challenge that we had with, with Leduc. So, uh, that's sort of the background of it. And so um, during this time, um, as Shirley pointed out, um, and I'll just get a picture of a lot of the work, this is a couple of scenes from the actual film. So lots of people were, it was very bad weather that day. Um, and so some of the workers couldn't really work outside. They pretty much had to stay inside. Um, uh, you know, they were playing cards or waiting for the weather to get better. And a couple of workers were working on the roofs because of the heavy snow. They didn't want it to, to, to collapse. So uh, it was a combination of people working in the tunnel, uh, some people working to get rid of the snow on the buildings and others just kind of kind of waiting it out. Um, and so I'm going to try uh, to play a little clip here if I can. Let's see if we can get that. If we can get that work, that'll be something. Nope. Uh, hmm. Well, we won't worry about that today. So as I said, it was snowing fairly heavily. Uh, they were trying to do construct a cap still. They were still trying to put up buildings. And uh, at some point, they just could not work anymore. And so they, they started to go in, in, inside. And then, of course, when the avalanche came, the reason the avalanche came, um, and I'm just going to go to this picture while we're talking about it, is that the snowpack had been relatively uh, light through most of that particular year. Um, and so it had crystallized. And when it crystallized, um, the new snow that was falling in February, which was pretty heavy, it actually kind of, it breaks much easier and it slides down. So this is what caused the avalanche in a relatively, as they thought was a relatively safe area. Uh, and so the avalanche was a bit of a surprise. And of course the end result was a significant amount of snow came down, buried a number of miners, uh, and for the longest time, there was 27 missing. They did find one uh, a few days later. And then, of course, 26 people uh, perished in, in that avalanche. The workers in the tunnel, uh, of course, were, um, were protected. They didn't really know what was going on. Uh, the only reason they knew something was going on was because the ventilation system had been shut down. And uh, because of the loss of power when the avalanche came down the, the mountain. So uh, the radio, the only good part of the, the, if there was a good part was that the radio shack was not destroyed. 
though the power was destroyed, the operator was able to connect um, the radio to batteries and was able to uh, call for help. And uh, I think it was received somewhere in Ketchikan and then it was relayed to the mine office in Stewart and to the RCMP and to others. So it was quite a rescue uh, effort. It took a number of days because of heavy snow. Um, helicopters couldn't get in right away. And so it was a pretty significant avalanche by Canadian standards, still one of the top worst avalanches in Canada. My goodness. Can you tell us a little bit more about the rescue efforts, having just seen how remote everything is there? Um, how, how quickly were people on the scene to help? Well, there were survivors. Um, all the miners in the tunnels uh, worked right away. So when they, when they got out, um, they um, started looking for people. And some were buried, you know, only a few feet and were able to actually get out uh, on their own. Um, they didn't have to need any help. They just stood up. And others were buried maybe five or six feet, had to be... Uh, um, um, sort of rescued um, and dug out. And uh, so then the, the missing ones seem to be all piled up in one area. So there, as far as the rescue, sir, there were some people right on, on the spot. And, and if I remember correctly, there was actually a doctor visiting the site that day. And so there was a medical person by chance at the medical, uh, at the place and the bunkhouse was still standing. So they were able to use that as a makeshift uh, hospital uh, the the workshop and the, the power plant and all that was of course destroyed and so when the call went out um there were people that left from ketchikan there were people that left from stewart um up to the glacier to get try to go across the glacier uh, and then of course there were um the canadian rcmp had sent people so there were all these people trying to to sort of come together to, to help the, this particular camp out. The food was destroyed. Um, they were able to find food. And they, one of the interesting stories was they were, uh, they used shovels as frying pans and, on an open fire to cook their steaks. And uh, so that's how they, they were able to, you know, they melted snow and they were able to, to cook some of their food using shovels, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. Some of the helicopters couldn't get in for, uh, I think, the disasters happened on a Thursday and some of the first helicopters that were able to arrive was, wasn't until Saturday. So they were quite on their own. Uh, they were alone for quite a while over, uh, you know, day, oh, almost two full days. So uh, almost two full days. You mentioned uh, that one, one man was found. Was it how many days later he was buried underground for a number of days, I believe. Yeah. There was a point where they decided, and I think he was discovered, um, I think about five days after the avalanche. And what had happened was he was under some plywood, I guess, wood from one of the buildings. Uh, I think he was in the workshop. So it had probably been something from the workshop building, but they were building a platform for the helicopters to land. And they kept driving either very close to him or almost over him, but they couldn't hear him. And so uh, eventually as the, um, uh, the caterpillar was grating the snow, uh, this piece of plywood kind of popped up and so did he. And that's how he was discovered. He was the, the last person rescued and the rest. Um, some of the bodies, I think it was months before they found all the bodies because it was somewhere so badly uh, uh, buried in the snow that they just couldn't get them till the thaw started. Wow. There's a, a comment here from Johan, Johan Slam in uh, Johan says that there was a gentleman found a few days after the avalanche and was located by an avalanche dog. Do you know that story, Ron? No, but I do know that they use dogs and it is in the documentary. Um, it, it's likely that the dogs did have some trouble, I understand, um, because of all the different the smells and chemical smells. It was somewhat masked, but I, I do know that they did bring dogs in and I wasn't, I'm not even sure how successful that was. Yeah, Johan believes that um, the first live dog find happened here at um, the Grand Duke. Although there is some contrary reports that the first avalanche dog find wasn't until Fernie in the 2000s. So that's interesting. It would be in good, interesting to know more about that. Yeah, yeah. Dogs were used, though. 
Yep, for sure. Oh, yeah, he says archived in the Vancouver Sun later that week. So there's, mm. uh, there's where, it, where it is. Thank you, Johan. Um, there are, before we, there's a couple more questions, but I think um, before we go to that, I think it's really important to note that this was happening during construction of the site. So this wasn't a, a complete camp. It probably, I guess it sounds like it wasn't in full operation. Is that correct? Oh, well, the mill was, and yeah, they weren't mining. This was um, uh, trying to put it into production. So the tunnel had not even been finished yet. And matter of fact, there hadn't been much uh, done on the Leduc side. And, and the term Grand Duke, some, some of your um, um, attendees will, will know this, but the Grand Duke stands for the Grand B Mining Company. And, and Leduc, or the Duke part stands for the Leduc. Um, or body. So that's how they got Grand Duke. And so uh, the, the idea, as Shirley explained, is that they were trying to, trying to take the ore from the Grand Duke to Tide Lake. And, and so they were still building that. There was no tunnel. So everything, there was, it wasn't like you could send a train down there to help rescue these people. It all had to be done uh, either by cat or by helicopter. There, was, there really was no other way of, of getting in. Amazing. And you said there were about 156 men working there at the time. Yeah. Um, and it, it looked like from the documentary, they were all ages. There was kind of a teenager looking guy in, in there. Is that, is that purposeful? Were they like, how, what was? It was a mixed group. Um, you know, people, I mean, it's a rugged, it's a rugged life for these and it, but it's good money. So people who wanted a job and wanted to make money and didn't mind the isolation and, I don't think they worried about too much about the danger, uh, but you know, it was isolation and good money. This was a good job. And uh, so they, you know, they, they would work and some would work for a few days, I think, and said, no, I'm, I can't take this and would go home and others would stay on and work for Grand Duke for many years. Uh, speaking of people who work there, Lee Murphy is here in the attendee room. And Lee said that um, he worked with you, Ron, at the warehouse the same time that you yep. did. Hi, Lee. How are you? <laughs> and then he flew into Leduc camp by helicopter in 1974 to do an inventory of the old camp. And it was a very spooky place in 1974, as most of the camp was still there with dishes and all the cooking stuff. What is left of this camp today? I can't answer that question. Maybe Lee can. <laughs> Because I, I I have not been back. Uh, matter of fact, there's not much left of Grand Duke. I think most of the the concentrator. I'm talking about Tide Lake now. The Tide Lake camp. I think everything is pretty much gone. Uh, you can still drive there, uh, though you go, the road. And that's the other thing that we didn't mention is that even the road from Tide Lake to Stewart had its own challenges, and avalanche challenges were pretty significant. And so there is a tunnel, um, just um, I guess past the summit of, of where you, the road would go back down to the Grand Duke where there's a mile long tunnel. So they even had to drive a tunnel on the road and it's a straight tunnel, one mile long. Pretty, pretty amazing. That is amazing. Well, thinking of the legacy of, uh, of the mine but also of the avalanche, surely. Uh, how, how does the town of Stewart remember the Grand Duke mine avalanche? Um, I think that, um... Grand Duke, uh, there's there's still people that always have memories. Uh, these are just some of the clips of the mine when it was actually complete. Definitely all of these concentrator uh, buildings on the left, upper side are gone and the lower side. Uh, some pieces of equipment are left at the mine, but on the Leduc campsite, it's just uh, some old rubble that was cleaned up. There's There's nothing really visible. I do believe there is a marker there to uh, remember the man that passed away at that site. So for us, um, what do we see here at the museum? Um, we have a lot of information on the mine itself and all the underground workings. I'm definitely not an expert at that. Photos of an ex the exploration camp in 1955 to 56 um, is here in an album that was donated two years ago to us. A collection of news stories about uh, the disaster itself. And of course, probably one of the best coverages was done by the Toronto Star Weekly. Uh, the disaster, um, they, they actually did um, a, um, 
live interview with Einar Melilla, was, who was the gentleman that was found, uh, had been buried for th over three days and uh, managed to survive. Uh, he had many challenges, uh, frostbite. Uh, they had flown actually a hyperbaric chamber to uh, assist in his recovery in Vancouver. And he did survive. So that was one good thing, but um, never was uh, wanting to go back into the mountains after his experience there for sure. One of our most treasured uh, records, of course, is, sorry, Anna's had to leave here for a second. There is the interview with Einar Melilla. And um, a few years ago, I guess it was in, uh, just before the 50th anniversary of the Grand Duke slide. So that would have been 2015. We had also been finishing up our cemetery project. Um, as some of you may or may not know, Stuart has unfortunately lost two cemeteries. The first one in, in uh, 1910 by, to the Bear River. Our second one of around 1964 to, from a massive landslide, another uh, of nature's natural disasters. So uh, the only cemetery we have left to show uh, today is the Wards Pass Cemetery just outside the town. And believe it or not, only two of the men that passed away at Grand Duke are interned at the cemetery. One of those is a gentleman by the name of Vilmos Fiquet. Vilmos, uh, this, this story is very, very interesting and, and um, we're very proud to have actually reconnected a family who had lost their loved one for over 50 years. Uh, Vilmos uh, came to Canada from Hungary in uh, about 1956. He was part of the Hungarian Revolution. So he had to flee the country and he uh, left behind his wife and two children, Vilmos Jr. and uh, his sister. And they also, they received letters, uh, they received gifts of uh, monies and gifts, and I understand also vaccine for the village children over in Hungary. Um, and then for a period of time, they heard nothing from Vilmos. It was about a year later and they received a check in the mail for $2,500 uh, in the form of a life insurance policy. Now, what you have to remember is during the uh, revolution years, any correspondence going back to the family was actually edited. So they didn't know where their father had died. They didn't know why he had died, didn't know where he was buried. So for 50 years, wondering happened. And we had posted our cemetery gravestones. You can see uh, the headstone at Ward's Pass in the top right corner there. And about three days before the 50th anniversary, I got a call from a gentleman down in the US who asked me if that picture was real and if it was, how could he get here? <laughs> so uh, he'd explained to me that they'd lost their father and this is the first time in 50 years that they were able to find out information wow. about him. So July of 2015, we were very, very proud to host uh, Bill Moss Jr. Uh, and his wife, and who had uh, experienced a tragedy in their lives with their young son named Bill Moss. And it was during the search on the internet about his trial that Bill Moss's head's gravestone came up. So I really, really like uh, to thank um, Mary Trace, who was one of our head leaders on our cemetery uh, project and for her posting all of these headstones on find a grave this family would have never been reunited so we're very very proud of that we wanted to actually take those names that are on the monument in our park and try to put faces to them we were successful with many of the men we've also done their genealogy uh, so we have a, a great record book here in the museum for that um, if you're here in Stewart, uh, come on in and see us. We'll talk to you lots about Grand Duke and show you a lot of things in our display behind me. Uh, also, take a walk in the park down at the boardwalk. You'll see the monument dedicated to the 26 men that passed away at Grand Duke. And uh, 
that is our story from my end. And Ron, I, I, I really, really want to thank you for your production. I've seen it many times, played it here in the museum. Uh, it was actually gifted to the Vilmos family to uh, help them understand what actually took place uh, in coincidence with their father's passing. So it was uh, a tool for healing for them. So I thank you very much for that. And I'll turn you back to Kim. Oh, it's awesome. Great. Thank you, Shirley. I ask you to stop sharing your screen there as we wrap up. Uh, that's a really touching story and such an important example of how sharing these stories of the past have an impact on people today and the importance of, of the work that you do at your museum and the importance of the film and helping people understand and, and to reconnect. So if you are able to visit Stuart or maybe you live there, uh, maybe on the 18th, you can wander past that uh, monument and think of, think of those lives that were lost although it might be buried under a bunch of snow still, uh, if, <laughs> if I understand Stuart correctly. <laughs> um, and then the, or on the 18th, you can get, you can see the documentary on Bad Day HQ on YouTube. Ron, what is the exact name of the documentary if people want to search it? It's, um, it'll be a, uh, it'll be the Grand Duke Avalanche. They can just type it in when they go to Bad Day HQ, they can just type it in and it should come up on the 18th. Um, if they're a subscriber, it'll, it'll automatically send them a notice. So, but uh, it won't be that hard to find. Great, well, thank you both so much. Um, and for those of you who joined us, if you joined us late and missed something or you'd like to go back or share this, it has been recorded and you will find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So please have a look there. Our museum has reopened and, you, and we are ready to welcome you back. You can find out more on our website about time tickets and exhibit. Next week, February 23rd, my guest will be Parks Canada archeologist and a traditional knowledge holder with the Nahani Consensus team to talk about archeological discoveries at the Nahani National Park Reserve. I hope you'll join us. Until then, take care of yourselves and one another. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you both. Bye -bye.